Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, penicillins and uh, beta-lactamase enzymes. Okay, so we've seen this first uh, modification that we made to penicillins, um, which uh, gave us the anti-staphylococcal penicillins, the aim of which were uh, that these molecules should be resistant to being degraded by beta-lactamase antibiotics, and therefore they are a effective against uh, Staphylococcus aureus bugs, uh, which are producing beta-lactamase um, enzymes, basically. Okay, so we've got six examples of these anti-Staphylococcal penicillins here. Now, the next modification that we can make to penicillins, or the other modification we can make to penicillins, is to try and make them more effective against gram-negative bacteria. Because this original penicillin that we made, penicillin G, well, we didn't make it, fungi made it. The, this original penicillin that Alexander Fleming found, it's not very good against gram-negative bacteria. And the reason is it's not awfully good at going through the porins. So, what we can do is try and modify the R group of the penicillin molecule in order to uh, try and make it better at going through the porin of uh, gram-negative bacteria. And this gives rise to what are known as the amino penicillins. Okay, so amino penicillins. And these penicillins are basically uh, penicillins where the R group of the penicillin molecule contains an amino group. That makes sense. And basically, this amino group helps uh, the uh, penicillin to go through the porin of um, the outer membrane of these gram-negative bacteria. It's also got a very small R group to help, um, you know, to make it easier for the molecule to negotiate its way through this porin. Okay, so these amino penicillins are better than the original penicillin at uh, gaining access to the periplasmic space of gram-negative bacteria and therefore gaining access to the uh, peptidoglycan transpeptidase uh, in the uh, cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. Now, examples of these amino penicillins are ampicillin, which is a very famous drug, ampicillin, um, and amoxicillin is another example. Amoxicillin. Right. Now, the problem with these amino penicillins is that they are incredibly susceptible to being broken down by beta-lactamase uh, um, beta enzymes. Uh, so if the gram-negative bacterium starts producing beta-lactamase enzymes, these amino penicillins, they don't stand a chance, basically. Okay, so for that reason, when you administer um, ampicillin or amoxicillin, it's very common to give clavulonic acid uh, along with uh, that um, penicillin molecule, basically, so that if the bacterium starts to produce beta-lactamases, the clavulonic acid can inhibit them and stop the beta-lactamase from degrading your amino penicillin molecule. So, uh, for instance, the combination therapy of ampicillin with um, clavulonic acid. So ampicillin plus clavulonic acid is a very famous drug used a lot. Clavulonic acid. Okay, uh, and um, it's known as augmentin. So when you hear people talk about augmentin, and you will see people being prescribed augmentin, it's a, it's a very common um, common um, combination therapy to be being used. Ampicillin plus clavulonic acid means augmentin. So if you see augmentin, that means ampicillin uh, plus clavulonic acid to prevent uh, ampicillin being degraded by uh, the beta-lactamase antibiotic. Uh, and enzyme, sorry. Okay, uh, next, uh, the final, um, final, uh, final class of penicillins uh, which is known as the anti-pseudomonal penicillins. So anti-pseudomonal penicillins. Or they can be called uh, the extended spectrum penicillins. And these are the best of the best, basically. These are the drugs which, firstly, are very, very good at getting through uh, porins uh, in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So this is expe extended spectrum penicillins. So they're very good at getting through the porins uh, or in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. And that's why they're called anti-pseudomonal penicillins. 
the bacterium Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a gram-negative bacterium and it's extremely resistant to antibiotic uh, treatment, basically. It's a horrible infection that people with uh, cystic fibrosis suffer from. I don't know many examples of where you'd suffer from it other than with cystic fibrosis. It's an infection that once you've got is pretty much impossible to clear it, and it causes major destruction of the airways of people with cystic fibrosis and is usually responsible for their deaths uh, due to respiratory failure. Okay, so um, these final classes of penicillin are designed specifically to kill Pseudomonas. Uh, and um, they, the way that they are extended spectrum is firstly they're better at getting through these porins than uh, of the original penicillin. So they've got the property of the amino penicillins that they are capable of getting into the periplasmic space of gram-negative bacteria and therefore gaining access to the um, peptidoglycan transpeptidase which they intend to inhibit. Okay. Uh, and the second thing is, they have the same property as the anti-staphylococcal penicillins, that they are also resistant to being degraded by the beta-lactamase antibiotic, uh, enzyme, sorry, the beta-lactamase enzyme. Uh, so basically, they have the two pros of both of these classes without the cons. Uh, the anti-staphylococcal penicillins, uh, they're awful at getting through these porins because they generally have quite bulky R groups. So they're awful at being used against um, gram-negative bacterium. The amino penicillins, they get through the porins well, but then they're degraded very easily by beta-lactamase enzymes. The anti-pseudomonal penicillins, to some extent, they have both of the uh, good properties. And they're also called extended-spectrum penicillins. Okay, so we want some examples of uh, anti-pseudomonal penicillins. So, examples then. I've got five examples for you. Carbenicillin. Carbenicillin. Um, is an example of um, a um, is an example of a anti pseudomonal penicillin. Then we've also got ticarcillin, ticarcillin. Um, then piperacillin is another example. And these are all drugs that you won't have ever been prescribed unless you were very very ill, uh, because. And if you've got a more sort of a more common infection, flucloxacillin is very very good at clearing it usually. Uh, so um, you wouldn't be, be being prescribed these sort of antibiotics to deal with. Say if you had an ear infection or a dental abscess, you wouldn't be being prescribed uh, these anti-pseudomonal penicillins. They're being we we don't want resistance to arise against these ones, so they aren't prescribed. Um, unless you really need them. So, azlocillin is another example. And uh, finally, you also have meslocillin, which is a another example of an extended spectrum penicillin. So, carbenicillin, uh, ticarcillin, piperacillin, azlocillin, and uh, meslocillin, they are all examples of extended spectrum um, penicillins or anti-pseudomonal penicillins. And they are extremely good at getting through the porins in the outer cell membrane uh, of uh, gram-negative bacteria and also at um, resisting uh, beta-lactamase enzymes, which are a mechanism of resistance to um, uh, penicillin antibiotics.